Good morning and welcome. Uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce and welcome Secretary Rick P Perry. Uh, this is his first trip to visit the West Coast Labs, and he had a, a busy day last few few days visiting uh, Livermore, San Sandia, Berkeley, and of course he leaped the best to the last and here today. <laughs> um, in the short time he had with us, uh, he had the chance to tour LCLS, walk through the under the hall and exper ex e uh, experiment. In particular, he actually used the uh, ro ro robotic arm to line up the laser beam with a sample. And then he went on to LCLS 2 con construction site, saw these equipment built in Texas. He also saw the undulator in the hall that he actually signed his name on, on there. So they will be with us forever. Uh, although he didn't have enough time to see and hear every, everything that you all do here, I think he, he certainly has a great impression of what the important things you are do, do, doing here. Uh, we really uh, appreciate him for the support and as, as an advocate for science. The 2018 budget, uh, Secretary deserves a lot of credit for advocating uh, fundamental science every since the first day he arrived on, on his job. Now, before I welcome him, uh, let me share with you a little bit of his uh, accomplishment. Uh, secretary is the 14th uh, Secretary of Energy. Uh, before that, he was the longest ser serving uh, governor of the uh, state of Texas for 14 years. Uh, he also uh, uh, is a veteran of the United States Air Force. He flew uh, one of these uh, C-130 tactical uh, airplanes. And he also is a, a, a farmer, a rancher, and the, one of the first of his family uh, went to college. So he's passionate about a, a, a education as, as well. Secretary Pat Perry. Thank you, Dr. Chang. Thank you. Dr. Chang, thank you very much. Um, I, uh, Bert, how are you? It's not every day I get to see somebody like you. <laughs> and, uh, so, well, <laughs> I hope that's okay. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting story is I have, um, kind of educated myself along the way over the last year about all the different things that the Department of Energy does, which kind of gets to or, or, that. Um, my first outing to represent the United States uh, was, I think, April of last year. And we went to Rome to be a part of the G7. Uh, and it was uh, my counterparts and and uh, six other countries that make up that, uh, that group, and we were talking about a lot of different issues and what have you. Uh, but I was coming home and uh, got on an aircraft, was going from Rome to Frankfurt to make a connection, and a gentleman was walking past me, and he looked at and then he did a double take, and so he recognized me, and I, I don't know. You know, whether people recognize me because I was the governor of Texas for 14 years, I ran for president twice, or I was on Dancing with the Stars. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, you know, but anyway, and he just put his hand out and said, Secretary Perry, I work for you. Uh, and we were all getting on the plane. I said, well, I, said, well, I hope you're, I said, I hope you're happy with that. <laughs> and, and he said, oh, yeah. And I said, well, I'll, I'll visit with you here in a second. We get leveled off and squared away when we get up and walk around on the aircraft. And I did. I went back and, and, and said hello to him. And, um, and, and I said, so where do, you, where do you work over in this part of the world that, that we would work together? And he said, Interpol. And at that particular point in time, uh, it, the, it, it started my... Um, education process about that this department is really a, a fascinating place. Uh, it is, uh, has deep roots into places that a lot of people may not recognize all the different things that we do um, uh, on the, you know, the, the nuclear side of things and the classified side of things and then the unclassified side, side of things. Um, 
Provost Drew, your dad, uh, you know, one of the great uh, products of, of this place and uh, this institution and, and this agency and uh, one of the great arms control specialists uh, of the world. And he, he was part of uh, what you do. And I think the, one of the things that, that, that excites me every day about why I get up and get to go do what I get to do um, is you all are involved in science. You all are involved in uh, experiments. You all are involved in day-to-day -day operations that literally have the potential of changing the world. Um, not everybody can say that. There was a question I got asked yesterday when we were over at uh, uh, Berkeley and, and we were one, one of the young people uh, asked about why is, it, why is it important for me as a young scientist to be at this institution working with the Department of Energy? And, and it's probably, well, it's not probably, it is. It's, it's, this, is a, this is a powerful statement of who you are. And one of the reasons I'm really proud to be associated with men and women like you is because the young scientists in particular could be working in a lot of different places. I mean, within a 30-mile radius of this particular place are some pretty cool companies to work for. And you could be making a hell of a lot more money, most likely, than working in this place. But here's why your being here is so important to you and to the world we live in. The collaboration that goes on at an institution like this, uh, the, the people that you get to rub elbows with, maybe down at the canteen and having lunch, or whatever the name of the place is that you have lunch. <laughs> is invaluable. You're, you're, you're making a difference. Uh, one of the things that has become so uh, clear to me in the course of the last year as I've traveled the enterprise, I'm, I'm approaching having been to every one of the labs now, uh, is the importance of supercomputing. And it doesn't make any difference where you are in this, in this, in this big enterprise, what you're doing. I was talking to John down who's doing the uh, the most current work on the ALS, and, and uh, the and we, we were talking about data, and we were and, and and the importance of having uh, the data to be able to put in. He said, "We'll give you plenty of data. Don't worry about that." He said, "We'll get you the data uh, to to be able to be analyzed." And across the board. If there's, a, if there's a central focus of what we do, it's making sure that the Department of Energy has the funding to keep us on track to be able to stay very, very competitive in the computing side of things, whether it's getting us to exascale or getting us to what the next gen is after that. If, if we stay that course, um, we'll be successful. We'll make a difference. We'll literally change the world. Um, and and I, I don't think there's anything that I've been more uh, proud of than to be associated with this. Um, I was telling Persis um, earlier in a little conversation, I said, I'm going to be honest with you, the best job I ever had was being governor of Texas. I ain't going to lie about it. The best job I ever had. And, and for, for a lot of different reasons. But the, but the coolest job I've ever had is this one. And it's because of people like you. As I've traveled across this DOE enterprise and, and, and met with a lot of times young men and women, sometimes a little more mature, but the power of what you're doing 
the excitement about what you're doing, the passion of which you exhibit. I've been, I've been doing this government thing for almost 40 years. And nowhere in my time, whether it was a pilot in the Air Force, whether it was a young uh, appropriator in Texas, uh, whether it was an agency head or whether it was the governor of the state and now the Secretary of Energy, no place have I found more passion, more excitement about where I get up and get to go work every day than I have in the DOE complex. And it's because the things that you do, the projects you work on, really matter. One of the other things that we, we, we do in government, uh, and I'm a, I'm a believer that government has a role to play when it comes to dealing with getting a concept out of a lab and getting it commercialized where the people actually can see the benefits of, you know. I happen to think that's why people, one of the what reasons people pay their taxes is so that we make good decisions to fund experiments that become... I'll well, give you a good example. We were talking about uh, this facility right here. There were a lot of people that said, you are wasting your money. When this, this advanced light concept came to be talked about, there were critics and really smart people out there, Bert, who said, you're wasting your time, and more importantly, you're wasting our tax money. Hmm. Some things never change. There are people out there today that are saying, government is not supposed to be spending the money for that. I heard it as a governor. I helped create a program called the Emerging Technology Fund in the state of Texas, where we actually took taxpayer money and we invested in early stage technology in that place out here on the west coast they call it the valley of death where great ideas and concepts go to die but from time to time you make some jello stick on the wall right madam provost And it changes people's lives forever. That's what you do. That's what DOE does. That's why I'm so proud to be a part of what you're about. Energy secretaries come and energy secretaries go. I know that. But while I'm here, I hope that we find ways to work together, that we find solutions to challenges that vex us as a society, that we spend our days uh, as, as much as we can, really focused on those challenges and how we, as a department in this case, and with our university partners really find solutions to these challenges. I went to school at Texas A&M University. Um, nobody in my family, my, my sis and myself, uh, I went to school to be a veterinarian. I, I know, it's, we, we, uh, I married a University of Texas grad, so it's, it's, it's good hybrid vigor. It, that's okay as well but I was with a chemist yesterday a young man um, over at uh, Berkeley in, in the um, advanced materials lab and we were talking to him he's a chemist and I told him I said organic chemistry changed my life he looked at me kind of funny and he said what do you mean I said well I was going to be a veterinarian until 16 hours of organic chemistry changed my life, and it, <laughs> and it made a pilot out of me. So, uh, <laughs> I know. There were, 
it, it's really interesting how many people's lives have been affected by organic chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and not necessarily in a bad way. It, it all turned out all right. I, uh, but my point with, with that is that the, 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 this avenue that we sometimes think we're on, and, it's, and that goes back to this whole idea of we're going to be working on some things that don't change the world. But we don't know that today. And it's why what we do is so important. We get up every day knowing that what we are working on may have that impact. And know that I share that passion, I share that curiosity that I hope everyone in this auditorium has about what our mission is. And, and, and no offense of, of any of the rest of government. I'm not, uh, I'm not being critical of them, but I know what DOE does. I know what our mission is. And I know that there are the most capable men and women in the entirety of government that work at this agency. And I'm proud to be a part of that. And one of the reasons I wanted to come out here and to share with you not only was to edify myself more about what you do and why, as I go back to Washington, D.C., and as I talk to uh, OMB or I talk to uh, committees uh, in, in Congress and I can explain to them in a layman's way which the vast majority, there ain't a lot of physics majors in Congress, okay? There's a few. There's a few. We got uh, Charlie, who is at Fermi. But the point is, most of them don't understand what you do. And one of my roles is to be able to go back and say, here's why this funding is important. And I back that up by saying, and I managed big things as the governor of Texas. Now, I get it. You may not politically agreed with everything that we did in the state of Texas. I know Jerry Brown still is a little bit raw about me coming over here and trying to recruit businesses from California to take them to Texas. I get that. Competition's a good thing. Competition's a good thing whether you're a governor of a state or whether you're a scientist at SLAC. And it's that competition that drives us. And, and, and that's a, another thing that I'm very comfortable with as we talk about, you know, what our role is, what our goals are, what our collective community needs to be doing together, uh, of, 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 of working together, but we're also competing. Because God knows in the world we live in today, we're competing. We're competing with some countries that really are good at what they do. And we better get it right. And we need to be first. Supercomputing is just one of those. So I wanted to come today and tell you thank you. Thank you for what you do. I am incredibly proud to be on a team uh, with uh, men and women who make a difference. And with that, Doc, come up here and let's wrap this up with a few questions. And, and uh, Thank you. Um, so, because a lot of you and the secretary have finite amount of time, so we collect the qu questions ahead of time. So, it depends how much time you have, Mr. Secretary. Depends on how the, long I talk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the first one uh, is, you recently stated that energy security is a roadmap to economic prosperity. Given the finite resources available for fossil fuel energy exploration, will you agree that investing in renewable energy is essential to the long-term U.S. energy security? Yeah. So, the... The, the things I heard out of that question are about um, um, energy security and limited resource. And I, and I think in the grand scheme of things, you know, yes, th these fossil fuels are a limited resource. I always try to take people back, and I'm, I'm going to share a little bit of a story story here with you to kind of understand where I come from philosophically and, and from a experience, life experience. Um, Fifteen years ago, there was a guy traveling around the country uh, making pretty good living giving a speech uh, that he titled Peak Oil. That we'd found all the, uh, uh, the we'd, we'd found all the fossil fuels, if you will, we'd, we'd 
we'd basically been able to extract at an economic level. He wasn't saying, here's what you have to transition to, but you're going to have to transition to something because this one's done pretty well and we're on this decline curve. Now, now he gave a, his speech was a lot better than what I just <laughs> gave you, by the way. But the point is that that hit the high points of it, that we had found all of it. If we, we did discover any more, the cost of producing that was going to be um, exponential. Except there were some people like the scientists here who didn't buy into the you can't do this, advanced light source, it's, it's, a, it's a waste of time, money, and, and by the way, the physics don't work. There were some people out there, one of them was a Texas A&M graduate, <laughs> I'll keep going back to that, Just by the name of George Mitchell. George Mitchell was a Renaissance man, he was a 1940 um, graduate, geologist, he was also a real estate guy, and a, uh, the physics department at Texas A&M is named after George Mitchell, he's a fascinating guy but he was also the man who believed that hydraulic fracturing would work. And then there was parallel science going on at national labs dealing with directional drilling, being able to keep the polycarbonate bits or the, the uh, adhered to the bit, I should say. Those two collectively changed the world. And it changed the world because they were able to hydraulically frack, and directionally drill. And today, the geopolitics of the world have changed because the United States is now exporting liquefied natural gas to 27 different countries. And 12 years ago, we were to be importing that gas into this country and frankly being held to particular standards by countries that not, don't necessarily have America's best interests in mind. And let me tell you why th that's important. From a global standpoint, and not because of the geopolitics of this, but because of the result of changing from old, inefficient type power plants Texas is the 12th largest economy in the world. And I know California is the 6th largest economy in the world. <laughs> I, 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 I respect that. So, but it's not inconsequential. 20 million people when I started being the governor, 27 million people when I got through. We had a massive growth of population. We also led the nation in job creation. Uh, the educational standards in that state went up substantially. We were 27th in the nation in high school graduation rates in 2001. By 2011, we had the second highest high school graduation rates. If you were African American or Hispanic, you lived in a state that had the number one high school graduation rates. Reason that's important is because tax policy, regulatory policies, public school policies that turn into skilled workforce matter. And people move to my home state, more than any other state in the nation. A lot of jobs created, seven million people added to the population rolls. You know what that means? A lot of pickup trucks on the road, right? <laughs> Everybody got a job, they got them a pickup truck. And what does that tell you? A lot of non-point source pollution. Right, Bert? Yes, sir. That's what your conventional wisdom will tell you. And that's correct. So. Did a great job putting tax policies into place, getting people to move to your state, but boy, you had to play hell with the environment. Because you added all that non-point source pollution, you had all those power plants out there doing those things. But that's not what happened. What happened was a state that recognized government has a role in dealing with environmental policies that will improve the environment that you live in. Gulf Coast, 
largest petrochemical footprint in the country. Latitude-wise, pretty good place to produce ozone. So all of these signals were lots of pickup trucks, ozone from your petrochemicals, your power plants are putting all this stuff out. Your environment went to hell. Had to. But there were some people thinking about how do we affect that. And what we did was we gave some incentives using our franchise tax to fleet engines to change out their older, older burning for cleaner burning engines. We had this massive, massive change from older inefficient power plants to cleaner burning natural gas plants. And we led the nation in wind energy production. Nobody else even got close. Texas produces more wind than five other, not other, we're not a country, uh, five, <laughs> we used to be, <laughs> but five countries. So this, this, I mean, huge shift to renewables because we believed in all of the above. And here was the result. We had a decrease of 60% of NOx, over 50% SOx, SO2. We had a almost 20% decrease in carbon dioxide. And the reason I share that with you, and, and, and I know this is a long going on about this, but this is important. And it's important because you can have economic growth and you can take care of your environment. But it's going to be science that comes up with the cleaner ways to burn these fuels. Because the world's going to use fossil fuels. I mean, wish and hope all we might that we could just go to completely renewables. But the world is going to burn fossil fuels. How do we do it in the cleanest way possible? What's the, what's the, and the science of that's going to come from DOE. I, I'm, I'm very comfortable that the science of that is going to come from a university that's working with DOE. That that's, our, that's one of our challenges as a society. But I do believe with all my heart that you can have economic growth. You can improve people's quality of life. You can deliver energy to places that don't have it today. It's our job. It's our challenge. It's our responsibility to find the ways to do it in a thoughtful, clean, economic way. Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> uh, second question uh, related. I somewhere. promise this will be a shorter answer. <laughs> uh, do you think reduced environmental regulation of the energy industry will result in benefits for consumers? If so, how do you quantify the value of any improvements against the potential environmental impact of reduced re regulation? Um, you know, this is kind of one of those, what the definition of is, is, <laughs> and in, in the sense of, you know, what do you, what do you mean by reduced environmental regulations? And I, I don't know who answered that, but let me, let me kind of just take a stab at it. I'm a big believer that government has a very important role to play when it comes to putting rules and regulations in place. We've we got a role. You know, whether it's deciding what the speed is you drive on a highway, because there's always going to be somebody that will go outside the bounds of what the, the rules and the regulations are. And then it's the government's job to, uh, to police that, if you will. But regulations just for the sake of regulations because a regulation may sound good on its face it may it may may look good but the unintended consequences of that may may cost you money may not be a benefit that outweighs the the cost at all and i think that's the and and, and we argue about this and it's okay to argue about that it's one of the great things about democracy is it you know finding that balance you know it's like I can't, uh, Melinda and I were talking about why 
you came back here to work and that, you know, it's like the conversation we have with the young scientists that come back here, that money is, you know, having enough is, is the issue. <laughs> and my wife and I argue all the time about what's enough. Uh, <laughs> Kind of like, you've been in public service for 40 years, dude. You've done your part. <laughs> but anyway, so finding that balance with regulations is, is the key. It's one of the things I did as a governor. Uh, Dr. Real and I were talking about, you know, why being governor was the best job I ever had, and it's because you really can, you, you, you have to come up with solutions, and it's responsibility for you to do these things, and you make decisions that affect people's lives with regulations. So the point is, we've got to take care of our, our, our environment, whether it's our economic environment, whether it's the environment we breathe, whatever it is. Government has to take care of that. Can you do it in a way that is economically feasible and, and, and doesn't cost you more than what the benefit is? So, I mean, that's a, a, that's a really hard question to, to answer. And we could be in here for the rest of the day arguing it round or square, and, and, but I'm not. Um, so um, let me just say, I, I think the, the, the real goal here is to listen, to be fair, to be thoughtful, to let science guide you, and you'll come up with you'll come up with uh, a a fairly good solution. And I say that because I, I I saw it happen in an economy smaller than California, but not inconsequential, of being thoughtful about how you affect your regulations and how it can affect the environment that you live in. You can do both. You've got to be smart about it. You've got to be committed to science. And you've got to be willing to spend the money to fund the science that will help you come up with the challenges that vex you as a society. <coughs> Doctor, let me finish up by saying, as I walk off this stage, how proud I am to get to work with you. Um, I truly believe that the men and women in this audience that work at our national labs are the real jewels in crown that we have called our national labs. Our national labs are not great because the federal government just decided to name them national labs. They're not great just because the federal government sends some money to them. They're great because men and women like you have chosen to be in these labs, doing this work, making a difference in your fellow citizens' lives. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.